A few years ago, Veritasium posted a video called Your Body's Molecular Machines. The video showcases some amazing animations of the process of cell division created by Drew Berry at the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute. But despite being super cool to look at, the animations are misleading. They make it seem as though the cell is no more than molecular clockwork, and that at the bottom, we're just nanobots. And if you scroll down to the comments, that's exactly the reaction you get. Dogs are just extra complex PS4s. Biology is just nanotechnology. Life is just the organization of non-living components. But this machine metaphor is hardly true. It fails to capture the true nature of proteins, oversimplifies the cell, and gives us a false sense of confidence in how much we know about the biological world. Don't get me wrong, Veritasium is one of my favorite channels. Derek is half the reason I've been inspired enough to make YouTube videos. Plus, these animations would be an incredibly useful learning resource for students learning these processes for the first time. But it's one thing for a high school student to use machine thinking as a learning tool, and a completely different thing to use the metaphor at the core of cancer biology. But we'll come back to that. Let's go from the start. Why isn't the cell run by molecular machines, like the animations suggest? Well, first we need some criteria to distinguish machines from non-machines. So what links together trains, cars, computers, toasters, clocks, and bikes? Well, each of these machines is made up of smaller parts, which have relatively fixed solid structures, and each part has its own specific function, like allowing the bike to move smoothly or telling you what hour it is. Molecular machines seem to have all of these features too. At least, that's what it looks like in the animations. The molecular machine needed to copy your DNA is made up of smaller solid protein parts, and each of them is only doing one specific thing, like splitting apart DNA into its two strands. So this really is a machine, except reality is a whole lot more complex than this. For starters, the structure of proteins isn't hard and rigid like we see in the animations. They're actually more like dense liquids that constantly jiggle around inside the cell. Drew actually adds this jiggling into some of the later animations, but we can see it better in this simulation from the Skidmore Computational Biophysics Lab led by Aurelia Ball. This is already strike one for the machine metaphor, because if my bike jiggled this much, I wouldn't be able to go very far. Normally, to analyze the structure of proteins, biochemists crystallize purified protein samples into a solid form first, and then blast x-rays at them through a process known as x-ray crystallography. This has been the gold standard method for many years, but if this is all we use, it would be easy to fall into the trap of thinking all proteins are static, because you have to stop the protein moving first before you do anything. If your only tool is a hammer, then you're gonna look at everything like a nail. There are other methods which keep the protein jiggling in solution when it's being analyzed, and these results have been pretty revealing. Far from simple cogs in a machine, proteins have flexible, dynamic personalities. They open and close, twist around, and can even rearrange into completely different structures. Which brings us to point number two. For many years, the reigning hypothesis has been that every protein has a single shape or conformation known as its native structure. This is also a myth. Proteins almost never have one single shape. They have a bunch of different configurations that they shift between. In one environment, they might take on one shape, and then when they bind to a molecule or when the chemistry of the cell changes slightly, they might take on another shape. Proteins can even switch between conformations in the same conditions, so there's at least some intrinsic randomness involved in protein structure. The extreme version of this are a group known as Inherently Disordered Proteins, or IDPs. And in mammals, they make up around a quarter of all proteins. IDPs are much more like cooked spaghetti than gears in a machine. They flop around with no set structure to them at all. And this isn't an evolutionary mistake or anything either. Disorder is often essential for the function of these proteins, because it allows them to bind to multiple different molecules. This flexibility just isn't possible with a single rigid structure. So the idea that an artificial intelligence like Google's AlphaFold has predicted the structure of every protein known to science is questionable because of the existence of these IDPs. I'm sure they're laughing at the AI trying to box their structure into one single shape. As Redditor SD Real wrote, you can take a blurry picture of a person, but you have no idea how well they can dance. X-ray crystallography and computational techniques like AlphaFold are still useful in generating high resolution images of proteins. But we should realize that these tools are just the beginning for understanding protein structure. To get a complete understanding, we have to look at how proteins change through time. We have to see how proteins dance. All in all, the physical structure of proteins is very different to that of machines. 
But surely we can still say that proteins have specific functions like the parts of machines, right? That's certainly the idea we get from these kinds of diagrams. This is supposed to be a general map of some of the metabolic processes happening inside our cells. The design of these diagrams is stolen from electrical engineering, where each component in a circuit plays a clear function in the workings of the whole machine. Is the analogy valid? No. For many years, enzymes, a subgroup of proteins, have been thought to only interact with specific molecules. Take the enzyme methane monooxygenase, or MMO. Like the name suggests, MMO was originally thought to convert only methane into methanol via a reaction known as hydroxylation. But we now know that in addition to methane, it can hydroxylate 150 other molecules. Biologists call this moonlighting because in addition to its day job hydroxylating methane, MMO also works 150 other odd jobs around the cell to make ends meet. This is quite an extreme example, but the same thing occurs throughout the whole cell. For instance, the ribosome works its day job turning RNA into protein. And actually, because this process looks so much like a conveyor belt, it's become one of the most famous molecular machines. But we now know that it too moonlights in other parts of the cell, like in the nucleus replicating and repairing DNA. Often these moonlighting gigs are very hard to predict. Dan Nicholson writes, a protein can have very different functions depending on where it's located in the cell, on the cell type in which it's expressed, and on the nature and number of proteins it binds to. Most proteins within the cell are rapidly moving about, continuously interacting with ever-changing partners. Pretty strange for parts of your machine to be doing a bunch of unpredictable jobs. So because of this promiscuity, it's a huge oversimplification to draw diagrams like this, where proteins only have singular functions. These are only going to represent one possibility out of an essentially infinite number of ways proteins could interact. Again quoting Dan Nicholson, All things considered, such representations probably do more harm than good as they wrongly imply that the proteins featured in them reliably and predictably form the same exact networks of interactions, which are envisaged, again misleadingly, as fixed solid state molecular circuit boards. So why do we use these diagrams and these animations if they're so misleading? One commenter on the Veritasium video put it like this, I like when humans finally caught up to this advanced biological process and had to compare it to machines that humans created that led to this discovery just to understand it. Instead of accepting the complexity of life, we've reduced the cell to a machine in order to be more optimistic about how much we really know. Here's an example of this in action. One of the most influential papers in cancer biology published in 2000 was The Hallmarks of Cancer by Douglas Hanahan and Robert Weinberg. It outlined six of the main capabilities of cancer and laid out a rough program for studying the disease into the 21st century. To date, it has over 39,000 citations, which in academia is officially known as a shit ton. It was so successful that in 2011, they released a sequel which has over 62,000 citations, also known as a metric shit ton. But at the heart of both papers is the machine metaphor, and the idea that if we just map out all the functions of proteins in one ginormous map, we'll just have to run some maths and we'll know everything we need to know to cure cancer. In 2000 they wrote, Two decades from now, having fully charted the wiring diagrams of every cellular signaling pathway, it will be possible to lay out the complete integrated circuit of the cell. And two decades later, we've not even come close to fully charting the wiring diagrams of the cell. Not because we haven't done enough science, but because it's quite literally impossible thanks to the promiscuous nature of protein interactions. Funnily enough, in the third installment of the trilogy published just this year, no circuit board diagrams appear and the machine metaphor plays a much more minor role in their thinking. It is finally dawning on us that the cell is not a machine. The metaphor has been useful to us, no doubt, but we've outgrown it and it's time we appreciated life in all its complexity. Then, and only then, can we begin to understand the true nature of the cell. Is it going to be much trickier than we initially thought? Of course, but who said science was easy? If you're interested in learning more, I can't recommend Dan Nicholson's paper enough. Link is in the description. I really think it should be mandatory reading for all biologists. And if you want to watch the original Veritasium video, it's up here. Honestly, I still think these animations are pretty cool. Props to both Drew and Derek. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.